Good evening this evening. We are on Jeremiah chapter 7. So this evening we're on Jeremiah chapter 7. We're going to continue with where we left off at last week where we uh, stopped at verse number 21. But prior to that, we're going to pray. And then what I'm going to do is like a little overview to bring you up to date from verses 1, well, chapters 1 through 6. Because we know we've unpacked a lot in Jeremiah. So it's a short little overview. So we're still going to be, we're going to do, finish up verses 21 through 34. So let us pray and then we're going to get started. Like I said, I'll do an overview and we're going to go straight into uh, the lessons. Let us pray. Lord God, we come humbly before you this evening, seeking your will and your way. We seek your will because we want to be blameless before you. We seek your way because we want to walk earnestly in the ways that you want us to walk. This evening, Lord, we recognize you as the only true and living God who provides for us, protects us, sustains us, and cares for us. We ask, Lord, that as we once again find ourselves in a room with others seeking your knowledge and insight regarding the book of Jeremiah, one of your prophets, that you open our thoughts and our minds so that we can understand what he is saying to us in this day and time. We ask, Lord, that you bless those who are here with us today and those who are with us in the virtual world. We ask that you bless those who are sick, shut in, and those who are incarcerated. We also ask that you bless those who are lost and unchurched. Make a pathway, Lord, so that they can find their way to you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So again, like I said, we're going to do a short overview of verses, uh, chapters, 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 one through six, so that we can uh, kind of remember <laughs> where we've been. Because like I said, Jeremiah is so packed with, it's, it's packed with so much, so much in it. So, let me see. I am going to throw it real hard. It gets on my nerve. It do what it want to do. It's like it has a mind of its own, and it's not. You're just a machine anyway. The purpose. <laughs> we had a purpose. We have a key verse, and then we had the main themes of Jeremiah. So the purpose of the book of Jeremiah was to call the people of Judah back to faithful dependence on the Lord. He warned them of the punishment of exile, that was coming quickly upon them as the Babylonians expanded their empire. So Jeremiah, and that's why he weeped all the time, and he's known as the weeping prophet, because he knew the judgment that was going to come or the punishment that was going to come upon his people because they were going to have to suffer the wrath of God because of their continuously breaking the covenant that God had laid before them. So the purpose of it was, again, to call the people of Judah back to faithful dependent on, uh, of the Lord. And remember, they had watched Israel's demise. They'd already seen their brother's demise. And, and Jeremiah did not want the same thing for them. So the main or the key uh, verse is, See, today I point you over the nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. That's Jeremiah chapter uh, 1, verse 10, chapter 18, verse seven, verses 7 through 10, and then uh, chapter 24, verse 6, and chapter 31, verse 28. So Jeremiah 1 is a number of things. There was a number of things that we saw introduced in Jeremiah 1 because there were a lot of them. God called Jeremiah as a prophet to the nations and appointed him over nations and kingdoms. So he was supposed to, as I just read, uh, uproot and tear down, to destroy and to raise, to build and to plant. Jeremiah was called upon to declare both judgment and restoration. 
God promised to watch over his, watch over his word and to perform it. And remember, Jeremiah was uh, looked upon by other people. All the people, they hated Jeremiah. They had a problem with Jeremiah because Jeremiah spoke the truth. Jeremiah spoke the truth. And so and they didn't like that because they wanted to continue to live as they had been living in, in, in their pleasurable, I want to say pleasure, because they liked the pleasure that they were given, uh, the, that, that, that they were having while they were living in those holotry ways. Y'all see me trying to be, uh, trying to use the words that Jeremiah and them were using, holotry. <laughs> I, I didn't want to say adulterous because that's what they were doing, but in their holotry ways. So the means of the divine judgment was revealed as disaster from the north. Remember, the armies from the north, tribes and kingdoms took a stand against Jerusalem. Remember, all these people, and, and, and the word kept saying, Jeremiah was saying that they were going to come from the north. The armies from the north, you know, they're going to come upon you. The reason for the divine judgment was the wickedness of Judah. They had become wicked. They had went beyond evil. They were wicked. You know, and God just kept calling, calling them, you know, to see what they were doing, but they didn't. Because remember, they were blaming God for, every, for their own sins. They're blaming God for their sins. You know, we're doing this because, you know, we're doing this because. But they were still blaming God because they were doing all these sins. So the reason for the d divine judgment was the wickedness of Judah, who had forsaken God, made offerings to other gods, and bowed down to their own gods, that they made with their own hands. Remember, they were created and making their own gods by this point. The subjects of the coming judgment were the kings, the officials, the priests, and the people of the land. So everybody, everybody, even the people. And, and remember, these priests and uh, some, some prophets were bad. All these people that were supposed to be looking over them and looking out for them were, out, were, were oppressing them. They were oppressing them. So they had all this going on. In the face of such a judgment, Jeremiah would know the divine protection and, and, and the ena enablement. So the theme of judgment meets us again and again and again and again. Because remember, he was always talking to them about their harlotry. He was always, he said, they played the harlot. You know, we saw that so many times. They played the harlot. They played the harlot. They played the harlot. So, and, and Jeremiah was really trying to get through to them. The term nation occurs 13 times in just these chapters. Now, one through six. So remember, we're just talking about one through six right now. So the term, the, uh, uh, the term nation occurs 13 times in these chapters in terms of being used as the agent of judgment. Because uh, he was telling him that other nations, we're going to come and, and, and be an army against them. And they were going to be the army of the Lord, remember? Um, God was going to be in that, in that other army that was coming toward them or coming for them. So the term nation to be used against them was said about 13 times. Then the term is used four times describing the enemy from the north. So that's four times. We saw that they were saying the foes from, some of your Bible says foes, so foes from the north or enemy from the north. So, and you can find that at chapter 3, verse 17, chapter 4, verse number 7, chapter 5, verse number 5, and then chapter 6, verse number 22. And that's where you see it, where he's called, they're called out of the foes or the enemies from the north. The enemies from the north. It is also used twice in contempt of the people of Judah. So in contempt, when God was, you know, like, they, they were like a bad nation to him, you know. Um, and that was chapter 5, verse 9, and then also chapter 5, verse number 29. So the sin of Judah, the sin of Judah is described in several different ways. Their wickedness denotes both the wickedness of Judah and the calamity which would come upon the evildoers. Play the harlot, like I just said, play the harlot, occurs a number of times in these chapters. We saw that so many times. Some of your Bibles use the W word. Y'all know what that word is, and I don't say it, but some of y'all <laughs> Bibles use that, but uh, I use the harlot, I prefer harlot. Uh, occurs a number of times in these chapters as another one of Judah's sins. That was one of her main sins. Both Judah and her sister, y'all know who the sister is, Israel, 
were both described as faithless. They were described as faithless. And remember, another name your Bibles may use for the word Israel is Ephraim. And remember, Ephraim was Joseph's youngest son. Because Manasseh, you had Ephraim and Manasseh, Ephraim and Manasseh. So, and Manasseh was older than Ephraim. And so Ephraim, you see that name, you see that name used in place of Israel several times. So we going to, it worked. Jeremiah chapter two appeared to have followed a pattern in two different segments. Y'all going to remember some of this because some of this we did talk about. Uh, we went over this where uh, they had, you know, we went over the patterns and the segments. So uh, it was divided into two different segments, really starting at, at verse number, Jeremiah chapter two, verse number eight through eight verses, eight through 25. That's a segment. And then verses 26 through 37. So in verse number eight, it mentioned priests, lawyers, rulers, and prophets. These guys, these rulers, these were, the, these were all your leaders of the people. These were all your leaders. They were punished for their misdeeds. Because remember, they were leading the people astray. They were the ones leading the people astray. For their own prophets, they were also oppressing the people. And God was not pleased. So in verse number eight, you had, you're going to see uh, priests, lawyers, rulers, and prophets are punished for their, their deeds. And then in verse number, and all this is chapter two. And then in verse number nine, God threatens a legal process. God put, was like going to do a case against them. Remember in the book of Job, you know, there was a case going on. This is the same thing. God is the judge. They're the, they're, they're the ones that's on trial. So, and then in verses 10 through 13, and this is chapter 2 again, Judah's rebellion against God is compared with the behavior of the nations, about those nations that's coming at him or coming at them, their people. And then in verses 14 through 17, a reference is made to the attacks of Assyria, and Egypt on Judah. Remember, they trusted these two. <laughs> they trusted both of these countries, Assyria and Egypt. They were their two biggest enemies, but they didn't know it, had their eyes closed. Then again, they knew it, but they chose to ignore it because they thought that they could use Assyria. They thought that they could use Egypt for their own gain, but it ends up they were using them. They thought they wanted, they wanted independence from God. That's what they wanted. And they figured they could get that through using Assyria and Egypt to help them. But it didn't work. And God would tell them, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. <laughs> you are supposed to be dependent upon me. And then in verse number 18, astonishment is expressed that Judah persists in going after Assyria and Egypt in a display of independence. What did I just say? Independence. <laughs> they thought that they could help them. Now, how are you going to think Egypt is going to help you and they're the one that held you in bondage so many years ago? Your, your fathers and your forefathers, you know. So, and then in verse number 19, judgment is announced on Judah because she has forsaken God. And then in verses 20 through 25, a rebellious Judah is depicted as a breaker of her bonds a wild donkey, except some of your Bibles use the, the, that A word that I don't use, um, a wild donkey, and a young female camel in heat. Remember, we talked about that camel and the, the donkey in heat, upon whom despair has settled. And that's all in chapter 2. That's verses 20 through 25, where it talks about how those two animals act when they get into heat. And then a similar pattern in verses the next session was verses 26 through 37, and all this is still in chapter 2. In verses 26 through 28, reference is made to, again, the kings, the, pri the priests, and the prophets. So this is almost like a repeated, pat uh, a repeated pattern. It's a similar pattern. And then uh, in verse 29a, we see Judah's legal process against God this time. And then in 29b, we see Judah's rebellion again. In 30, we see God's judgment. In th and, this, and, and in 31 through 32, Judah's bid for independence 
and her wicked deeds. And then in 35, we see the announcement of judgment. And in 36 through 37, we see Judah's fickleness and ensuring judgment and the tragedy of her shame and rejection by God. So it's more or less, it's, it's, it's these two sessions were basically saying the same thing. So we determined in this chapter that Jeremiah used the scribe also. Remember that scribe, Barak, or Baruch, <laughs> uh, to do his writing, at which time Jeremiah simply edited. And then when we were in chapter 3, and we were in chapter 3, we took notice, remember we took notice of the genre. Remember the genre of the sections because it was kind of unusual and was kind of mixed up. And this included chapter 3, the session goes all the way from, chap from verse 1 through chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. That was that entire section. So we observed that verses 1 through 5, 19 through 25, and then also verse, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, they were, written in they were written in poetry. They were in poetic form. And then we saw that verses 6 through 18 of chapter 3 was written in both prose and poetic. So it was written in both of them. And so the theme of that entire section is a call to repentance. Jeremiah is calling them to repent. So this section was concerned with the nation's apostasy, and it symbolized it with the vision of adultery. And you can see that at chapter, uh, this is chapter 3. You see that at verses 1, 2, and 3, verse number 6, and then also verses 8 and 9. Because remember, these uh, prophets, as we've been going through them, they all use symbols a lot, all of them. The nation would commit apostasy, which is turning away from God, and then they would turn back to God in repentance, but then they would turn away from God in apostasy, and then they would turn back to God, sort of like Judges. Remember the book of Judges? Only they loved doing what they were doing. Jeremiah repeatedly told them that if they would simply repent, God would forgive them and that they would receive his mercy. Because remember by this time, God turned his face away from them, which meant that God turned his back on them. Don't I ever think God would not turn his back on you? Because he showed us with his people. And remember what happened to Israel. We know Israel was simply no more. Now we're dealing with Judah. Israel is gone. So we got two and a half tribes that we're dealing with. Judah, Benjamin, and the half tribe of Manasseh. That's all that's left. Those other ten and a half tribes, they're gone. They're gone. The ten tribes with all those boys and the half tribe of the other half tribe of Manasseh. Because um, remember the Transjordan where they stayed on this side of Transjordan, the other half went with the others. So they, they're no more. Israel was destroyed, totally destroyed by Assyria and replaced with people that Assyria had taken captive over the years and years and years and years of their fighting when they were number one. So all Israel was, re was replaced by all these pagan nations. So Israel is no more. We're just dealing with Judah. Judah is here. And that's why Jeremiah is so frustrated. He's saying, remember what happened to Israel. And remember now, by this time, Samaria has become the capital of Israel. And now the Israelites that were hiding in the caves and stuff have by now came down and have merged with or got with or did it with those Samaritans that were there, and oh yeah, the Samaritans, the people in Samaria, and that's how they be, we got the Samaritans. You know? Y'all know what did it mean. So anyway, y'all know. <laughs> so anyway, so that's how we got Samaritans. That's why the Jews despised the Samaritans, because they, they were mixed with Israelites and, and the Samaritans or whoever else. And they didn't like them, because they knew that was against what God wanted. So beginning with... Beginning with Jeremiah 4 and 5, and I'm going to take it and throw it again. Beginning with Jeremiah chapter 4, verse number 5, through chapter 6, verse number 30, the focus is around the theme of the enemy or the foe from the north. Foe means enemy. Jeremiah referred to the enemy from the north several times. 
References to the enemy who would bring disaster are interrupted at one point by Jeremiah's anguished cry. Y'all remember he cried out to them and he did this whole big plea to them and stuff. And that's in chapter 4, verses 19 through 22. And then at another, by reference to Judah's sins. So he, he bringing up Judah's sins to them. Like this is the only, these are the only times that this was interrupted. And that was at chapter 5, verses 10 through uh, 31. Yeah. And then at another time, by an appeal to the people to stand by their old ways instead of depending on expensive rituals. Remember, they were getting those rituals and they were doing all this with these rituals that they should not have been doing. Remember, they were even doing uh, sacrificing children, sacrificing people, sacrificing children at this time. The theme of judgment was understood to be brought on by Judah's continual breaking of the covenant, which would bring upon them the curses or the judgments. So even though it was painful for Jeremiah to watch his people suffer, he knew that the consequences of rejecting God's covenant were a divine judgment. So that was what they, they and, and that was the wrath of God coming down on them. And Jeremiah, that's why he's known as the weeping prophet, because he knew what was going to happen to them. He knew that it was bad. He just did not want them to suffer. And he just could not understand why they would just would not just think about what had happened to Israel. Because that was that was a real that was like a slaughter. So will you read verses Belinda, I have to call your name out. So Belinda, will you read <laughs> verses twenty one? She's in chapter seven, verses twenty one through twenty eight. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offering to your sacrifices and eat the flesh. For in the day that I brought your ancestors out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to them or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this command I give, I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk only in the way that I command you so that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but in the stubbornness of their evil ways, they walked in their own counsels and looked backwards rather than forward. From the day that your ancestors came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have persistently sent all my servants and prophets to them, day after day. Yet they did not listen to me or pay attention they stiffened their necks. They did worse than their ancestors did. So you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not answer you. You shall say to them, this is the nation that did not obey the voice of the Lord their God and did not accept discipline. Truth has perished. It is cut off from their lips. Amen. Again, I'll ask you, when you're studying, when you're reading, study it. Don't just read it and run through it and stuff. As you look out for certain words as you're reading out there, studying, so that you'll see when things stand out to you, and that'll make you say, oh, why was this? Where did this happen? What happened? You know, that'll make you study. That means you're going to go back and you're going to look to see what this means and what that means and all that, because there's a lot in, in this. And that's in all your biblical reading. So what I want to do is stop for a moment and look back on the structure of this uh, chapter. So verses 1 through 15 refers to the temple in which uh, the people trusted was a cover for every kind of ethical and legal misdemeanor and would therefore be destroyed. The temple was going to be destroyed because of all the evil doing they were doing in this temple. And remember, this is the temple that Solomon built. This is during the prophet's time. So, and remember, it was a beautiful temple. Verses 16 through 20 refers to the fact that alongside the temple practices was the deep-rooted worship of the Queen of Heaven, which demonstrated a fundamental insincerity in the nation and was a symptom of the people's refusal to accept the sovereignty of God and his will. 
they would rather worship those false idols. Queen of Heaven, remember that was Astaroth, or Astarte, A-S-T-A-R-T-E. So, and those were female goddesses that they would rather worship. Then verses 21 through 28 refers to the fact that the whole sacrificial system had become meaningless to God. It was never his intention that either the temple or the sacrifices should become an empty form. So in other words, they, <laughs> in other words, they were worshiping and they thought that the temple they placed the temple higher than they did God because of it, how beautiful it was and how that they figured that they would do like church people, church folks. I should say church folks do today. They come to church on Sunday, sit there on Sunday for an hour. I did my thing. Now I can leave. You know, so that's what they were beginning to do. The sacrifices that they were doing back then, they would no, remember they sacrificed. They had the altar. They were sacrificing. So God is like, that's meaningful. You know, like today, you know, you hold up holy hands on Sunday and go to work the next day cursing somebody out. You know, that's meaningless to God. That is what he's saying. So all this, the sacrifice, back then they had the sacrifice. They burnt offerings and all that. Meaningless to God if the next day you're going to play the harlot. So that is what he's telling them. Remember last week I told you, you cannot invite Jesus in the living room along with your friend and go into the bedroom, but leave Jesus in the living room, and then come back out of the bedroom when you're finished and pick Jesus back up again. Jesus is going to be with you all the way to the back, all the way to the kitchen, all the way to the closet, all the way everywhere. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so verse number 21 says, what did you say, verse number 21? How do you start that off? There you go, right there. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Remember, when you see thus says the Lord, that is God talking. Those are words from God. Even though, he's, even though I, uh, Jeremiah is a prophet and God is talking through Jeremiah, when you see thus says the Lord, that is God speaking. That is God, that is God saying it's not Jeremiah's opinion. It's not Paul's opinion. It's not, it's not these people. It's God talking. So thus says, that's why I tell you when you read, Start highlighting stuff like that. When you see it, something that stands out to you in your reading, highlight it. Just look at it. Highlight. Let the scripture talk to you. Let the scripture talk to you. Let your uh, divina, let that scripture talk to you. And that's what it's doing. And then you just start, every, I see so much in here, thus says the Lord, for in the day. What day? You know, you should be saying the next verse says, for in the day. You should be asking yourself, what day? In what day? For in the day. I want to know what day they're talking about. I brought your ancestors. You should know who the ancestors are, but right then you ought to think. We're talking about way back when, back when Abraham and, and Isaac and Dean, but right here he's talking about Moses when they brought the ancestors out. So that's the kind of stuff you should ask yourself when you're reading, and then you just highlight this stuff because that's going to make you think and remember the stories. That's going to make you remember what was said. And if you don't remember it right then, it's going to make you look it up. So that's what you call studying and, and, and stuff. So you're going to be wanting to know what happened here, what happened there, what happened there. Yet they didn't. Yet it's another word like yet what, what, you know. So that should make you look at it. So the verse says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat the flesh. That's what it said. Verse number 21. Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat the flesh. The burnt offerings were entirely burnt on the altar of sacrifice. So now, this offering usually ascends or it goes up. Remember how free will offering, you know, it just goes up. The smoke, the aroma goes up. And uh, it goes up as smoke and flame from the altar. So now Leviticus chapter 1, verse 9b explains it. It says, then the priest shall turn the hole into smoke on the altar as a burnt offering, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord. So that's what that, that's what that, when you see the burnt offering, when you're saying that it goes up or it ascends up, it's a pleasing odor to the Lord. So Leviticus uh, chapter 1, verse 9b explains that. The other sacrifices or parts of them were eaten by the worshipers. So verse number 21 treats all sacrifices as the same. Since God does not care any longer 
which way the ritual is carried out. They had, just, they had gotten just that <laughs> evil, just that wicked, that their burnt offerings didn't matter to God anymore. He didn't care what they did with it. He rejects whole burnt offerings and other things. He didn't want it. He didn't want it anymore because he knew that they didn't mean it. Remember, they were trying to straddle the fence. They were, they were, they were, they were in the temple doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Remember, they still, and remember throughout all this, they still had, uh, they still had temple prostitution going on. And they had boy temple, should say men, boy, men temple prostitution with, with male and female. Maybe I should say that. They had both of it going on, but especially male prostitution in the temple. This is in the temple, in God's house. So no, he didn't care about these burnt offerings because remember, all this is still going on. The essential ingredient of any and every sacrifice is an attitude of obedience to God or to God's covenant on the part of the worshipers. That was, that, that was lacking. Remember, they've totally broken the covenant. They didn't care. And of course, the, the covenant included the, the uh, Ten Commandments. They didn't care. They were breaking all those rules. We saw that last week. They were breaking every one of them. They didn't care. So this verse refers to the, to the time in the Exodus. This is like the Exodus. When, see my Moses? This is the Exodus when after God's act of deliverance from Egypt, Israel accepted him. So after they were freed, they accepted him as their sovereign God. They entered into his covenant and they accepted the covenant obligation with the words and what they said, all that God has spoken, we will do. They said that. And this is Exodus chapter 19, verse number 8. They said all that God, after God delivered them, they were so glad. They were so, you know, they were so happy. They said all that God has spoken, we will do. So the first step in the covenant ceremony was God's demand for the unconditional acceptance of the covenant. They were supposed to just, and, and, and they were supposed to accept the covenant. They were supposed to do something, God was going to do something. Remember, a covenant is just an agreement between the people and God. The Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, do not mention cultic details. It was only after the covenant had been ratified that the cultic details of the tabernacle the priesthood, and the sacrifices were declared. So at first he just gave them the Ten Commandments. Thou should do this, thou should not do this, thou should not do this, thou should not. He just gave them the rules. Then he came back and he added the cultic things like what the priests were supposed to do, what, the, what, the, uh, what, what all would, would go on the tabernacle, you know, how everything was supposed to be set up. So at first he gave them, the, in, in Exodus, you know, he just gave them the Ten Commandments, you know, and, 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 other, and then Leviticus, you got all those other rules. There are 600... There are 613 rules that every Israelite would follow, and there are 621. <laughs> okay, 614. And then there's, you add 20, uh, what, seven more, you get 21. That include, those seven were added into for the priests to follow. So you had like 613 for the people, then the other seven, 621, I may be off a number. That's... Uh, for the priests, they had to do all those plus that seven. So these were, and that's how, that's the, those are the commands, rules, and all that. That's how many you'll see in Leviticus if you sit there and try to count them all up. So that's what that is. So that's what they had, and they didn't want to follow them. These, these, this newer, later generation, they didn't want to follow them. So the first, the Ten Commandments do not mention, okay, the culture de de details and stuff like that. So after it was ratified, after it was did all that, he added all that to it. So Jeremiah was saying that, that God was indifferent to the way Israel brought their sacrifices, even if they offered it in the form of a peace offering, the free will offering, the peace offering. He didn't even want that because they were so, <laughs> some of the stuff they were saying was just, and some of the stuff they were doing, I mean, just like the sacrifice, they were doing children sacrifices. They were sacrificing to Chemosh and Molech. Those gods that were uh, the Moab gods, you know, Moabite gods, they were, they were sacrificing to, to them. They were, uh, they were sacrificing children 
to them. So they were doing all this. That was an abomination. On a, that God did not want that. Y'all know that. He did not want that. Because of their disobedience, God refused to regard what went on in the temple as a true sacrifice. Any hope of God's blessing for the future depended on their walking in the way that God commanded them. That is, the blessings of the covenant were available only to those who walked or those who conducted themselves in accordance with the demands of the covenant. So in verse number 24, we see that the people did not obey God despite their declaration at Mount Sinai, but they followed their own counsels and their own stubborn will. So instead, in spite of what they had told God back then, and we know that's their ancestors, but that was passed on down to them. So despite, and even after Josiah, when he found the, uh, when, you know, they had lost the, the, the covenant, they had lost the Ten Commandments, they had lost all this, all this was lost in the temple and all that, and then he found it. When it was broken up, he found it, brought it back. He tried to do a reformation, and even after all that, even after all that, they still did not want to follow or recognize the covenant. They just did not want to do it. They wanted to live according to the way that they wanted to live. So they just didn't care. So in verse number 24, again, we saw that despite everything, they did not obey God. So as a result, they went backwards instead of going forward, or they grew worse instead of getting better. Deliberate rejection of the covenant obligations by one who rejects the covenant and the Lord of the covenant leads to deterioration. And that includes the land. That includes the land. So in verses 25 and 26, the concern of God that Israel should be faithful to him and obedient to the covenant uh, obligations is now declared. So that was in verses 25 and 26. In Jeremiah's view, Disobedience was as old <laughs> as the Exodus, and it was no new thing in Israel. God sent his servants, the prophets, with urgency and persistence. It was all in vain because Israel did not pay any attention to God. So in other words, they stiffened their neck. I think you read that. They stiffened their neck, and in fact, they outdid their forefathers in wickedness. They did worse than they did. The people of Jeremiah's generation were the inheritors of a long tradition of disobedience. They just did not want to do what God wants them to do. So in verses 27 and 28, the divine word had been given. It was Jeremiah's responsibility to declare it, and that's what he did. That's why they didn't like him, because no matter what they did to him, Jeremiah still kept uh, giving God's word. He never changed. He was the same. He still, he cried about it, but he did it because he wasn't crying because how they felt about him. He didn't care. His main thing was he knew the judgment. He knew the punishment that they were going to suffer. That's why he was crying. He felt sorry for the people. So it wasn't that he was scared and he was crying because of himself and what they were doing to him and they weren't listening to him. It was because he knew the wrath. He knew God's wrath that was coming. It was part of his understanding and experience that the people might not listen. He was used to that. Prophets before and after him had the same experience. People didn't listen to him. They, they didn't want to hear the prophets. They didn't want to hear that. Some of them, they killed, stoned. They did all this. They didn't want him. Jeremiah's description of Israel as a nation that did not obey the voice of the Lord their God and did not accept discipline was an accurate description of covenant breakers. So they got a name now, y'all covenant breakers. So when you out there doing stuff you ain't got no business doing, guess what? You're a covenant breaker. <laughs> You're a covenant breaker. And then verse number 28 says, truth has perished. It is cut off from their lips. God's primary design or primary demand was obedience, not sacrifice. So the, the, before the exile and after the exile, prophets looked for reforms in the administration of the rituals of sacrifice, but they did not teach that it was to be abandoned. Ezekiel looked for a restoration of the temple and its cultic officials and rituals. That's Ezekiel chapter four, chapters, and we'll get there, 
chapters 40 through 47. Ezekiel, they're trying to find answers. They're still trying to find answers. They're still trying to help the people. Hagar, Zechariah, and Malachi spoke of the temple and its officials, although Malachi was distressed about the attitudes of the priests, and he expressed the opinion that it would be better to close the doors of the temple because of how, 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 you know, how disobedient they were to God. He was like, we might as well close the doors. Y'all not doing what God wants you to do. We might as well close some churches. Y'all don't want to do what God wants y'all to do. You cannot just come and sit on the pew and then, you know, hold hands and jump up and down and scream and shout, run around the church sometimes even. And then on Monday, or probably before you even leaving out in the parking lot, you out there cursing somebody out. That's right, before the end. That, <laughs> yep. Monday, you get out there, you looking at people all funny and all that kind of stuff. You can't do that. Malachi 1 and 10. You can't do that. Will you read, and we're going to co close it out and finish it and be on chapter 8 next week. Will you read verses 29 through 34? Cut off your hair and throw it away. Raise a lamentation on the bare heights. For the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation that provoked his wrath. For the people of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house that is called by my name, defiled it. And they go on building the high place, the place of Tapia, which is in the valley of the son of Hanan, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. See their children sacrifice. Girl, go on. I'm sorry. I get excited in this word. Go ahead on. Nor did it come <laughs> into my mind. Therefore, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when it will not, no more be called or the valley of the son of Hanan, but the valley of slaughter, for they will bury in Tapia until there is no more room. The corpses of this people will be food for the birds of the air and for the animals of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. And I will bring to an end the sound of myth, the gladness, the voice of the, of the bride and bridegroom in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, for the land shall become a desolate. A waste, desolate. So in these verses, Jeremiah dealt with false religion in Judah. Judah is personified as a woman, and the words are meant for all the people. For their sins, the people must take up a lamentation. The cutting of the hair was a symbol of grief, was a symbol of grief. The hair was looked on as a crown back then, you know, your hair, your crown and glory. So the cutting of the hair was a symbol of grief. To cut off the hair was to bring down Israel's pride. And when I say Israel now, you know, I told you I go from Israel to Judah. I'm talking about, about Judah uh, because they were still, you know, the Israelites, they were still from the original tribe. So when I'm saying Israel, y'all know we just talking about at this point, Judah. Israel is no more. So uh, the long hair of the Nazarite was a sign of his consecration to God. And you see that back over in Numbers chapter 6, verses 2 through 8, it tells you about a Nazarite. So we have already did all that years ago. Yeah, it's been a couple of years. The removal of the hair signified an abandonment of his consecration. And you see that at Judges chapter 16, verses 15 through 22, and that should be about... Samson, verse, uh, Judges chapter 16, somewhere around there should be about Samson. And y'all remember the cutting of the hair. In Jeremiah's view, Israel now represented only Judah and Jerusalem. That's why I just said. So Israel represented only Judah and Jerusalem because, like I said, Israel's been wiped out. There are no more. Um, they had abandoned Judah after seeing Israel still. And remember, uh, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, of, uh, of Judah. Jerusalem is the capital of Judah. So they had abandoned her consecration to God and was not worthy to wear the crown of her long hair. The fact that the lamentations were to be made on the bare heights where so many Israel's evils had been committed was appropriate. And so what that simply means is up in the high places, 
Well, y'all build and y'all y'all created these high places that God told y'all to destroy and put all those idols, those false idols that he told you to destroy. So now, if y'all going to do all that, and y'all were doing all this sinning and doing all that work, sinful worshiping and worshiping them idols out there so everybody can see, I want this to be done so everybody can see. I want y'all to lament where everybody can see. So God had rejected and forsaken the generation of people who deserved his wrath, his own people. His own people, his precious people. And these are the only ones that's left. This is more or less like uh, Abraham and, 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 and Isaac with the sacrifice when he was saying, sacrifice your son to me. This was, his own, this was his son, the son of the promise. This is his son. You know, we're not talking about Ishmael. Ishmael is over. Ishmael got his son. So, because remember, when God make a promise, that included Abraham and all of his generation. So Ishmael over here, he got his, you know, he gone. Him and his mama, you know, they... Yeah, they were out in the, what he did, sent him out and everything. So, and he, remember, Ishmael was blessed and all that. So he was blessed just like Esau later on was blessed. So, you know, Jacob didn't get it all. Isaac didn't get it all. So anyway, um, in Jeremiah's view, like I said, Israel now represented Judah. Israel represented Judah and Jerusalem. Remember, Judah, Jerusalem is the capital. And so the lamentation was made on the bare heights because those were the high places. Let everybody see it. You ain't going to hide this. Let everybody see it. I mean, because remember when we read about them and uh, 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 when they did their little <laughs> rituals, they did it in the lowest of the valleys so the people could see there. They did it in the highest when they created the high places because they wanted everybody to see. So they wasn't hiding what they were doing. God rejected them and that whole generation because of what they were doing. So in verses 30 through 31, God, well, in verses 30 through 30, verses, 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 30 through 31 gives us the reasons for God's forsaking his people. Verses 30 through 31 gives us the reason God forsake them. For the people of Judah have done evil in my sight. The placing of abominations in the house that is called by my name, the temple, was a supreme act of defiance and a gross gesture of sacrilege. This act serves only to defile the temple and deny, deny the soul sovereignty of God because they were worshiping all those other idol gods. So they were denying the soul sovereignty of God. God is the one and only. They were denying all that. Jeremiah also found other practices going on in the temple which shouldn't have been going on. In the valley of ben Hinnon, south of the city, they built a high place of Tophet. This high place was the place of pagan rites. That's why, pagan rites, that's all they did there, which included human sacrifices during the reign of Manasseh, King Manasseh. And that's, you can find that over in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 10. And remember, we're talking about the Davidic line here. Manasseh is a descendant of the, in, in the Davidic line of David. You know, because remember also, Judah had one line. The Davidic line, that was it. Israel, on the other hand, had a billion lines. I ain't going to say a billion, but they had a lot of lines. All you have to do is kill the king. You can become king. Kill that king, you can become king. Kill this king. Some of those kings lasted two weeks. Some of them lasted a day. Some of them lasted, you know, because they were getting them by that night. So you had, that's what you had going on in Israel. You had a different king coming from all over. It wasn't just one family. They were coming from all over. So, and over here in the, the Davidic line was just like that. So this Manasseh was out of that line. He was just an evil king. You had, you had, you had, uh, uh, what, you had a couple of evil kings over here. But the most of them over in David's land were good. But on this side, over there in Israel, you had a lot of evil kings. So the practice of human sacrifice was known among the Amorites and others and was one of the principal rites in the worship of the god Molech, or M-O-L-E-C-H, Molech. It was forbidden under Mosaic law. And you can see that on the Leviticus chapter 18, verse number 21, then uh, Leviticus chapter 20, Verses 2 through 5, all firstborns were to be consecrated to God, but not by offering up children as human sacrifices. 
God had never commanded this evil thing. For these evil deeds, the people themselves, and not merely just the children, will be slaughtered by the invading enemy, which is that enemy of the, from the north, or that foe from the north. No longer would they talk about Topheth or the Valley of ben Hinnon, but of the Valley of Slaughter. That's what they were going to be called, the Valley of Slaughter. In that day, Topheth would be so full of corpses that many bodies would not be buried at all, but would lie in the open for the scavengers of the air and of the earth to dispose of them. That's what she just read. That's why I said when you're reading, read the Bible word for word so that you can see all this. You know, it may not, it'll make sense to you if you keep reading like that. <laughs> Believe me, because God is going to reveal it as you study his word like that. For the body to remain unburied and to become food for carrion birds or birds of prey and scavenging beasts was an unspeakable horror. Even a criminal's corpse, even a criminal's corpse was to be buried. So Deuteronomy 21 verses 22 and 23 reads, when someone is convicted of a crime punishable by death and is executed and you hang him on a tree, his corpse must not remain all night upon the tree. You shall bury him that same day for anyone hung on a tree is under God's curse. So it was an unthinkable thing for a man to die without someone to bury him. Then Psalm chapter uh, 79, verse number three says, they have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. So this picture that Jeremiah is giving us is tragic because it depicts the site of Judah's illegal sanctuary <laughs> was to become the place either of their burial or of the desecration of their corpse. That place is that temple. That's the temple. A natural consequence of all this would be that all signs of normal life, the sounds of mirth or the sounds of joy and gladness and the voices of bride and groom, bridegroom, which you just read, would disappear and the land would be a desolate waste. Amen, amen, and amen. So next week, Bible study, will be Wednesday night. We will be on Jeremiah chapter 8. That's July the 19th. So until next time, be blessed by God. Be a blessing to others. Be a person of God. Share your love. Share your faith. Share God's word. And share the blessings that you receive from God with others each and every day. Amen, amen, and amen.